John Noe unveils Greater Than We Believe with your host, Stephen King. Well, hi there. It's so good to see you again. This is Stephen King and my friend John Noe, my brother, <laughs> my best friend, John. <laughs> We're so pleased to be able to come and see you again. Um, we've been doing this for over five years. We've been so blessed. Mm. And I just thank the Lord that he has blessed the ministry. And we have got a worldwide audience. In case you didn't know that, we have people literally, literally all over the world watching this. In fact, Tuesday night, I spoke to... 15 pastors in India. In India. On Zoom. God bless you. Who have been watching us. Yes. Isn't that yeah. something? And, uh, and they emailed me back or, yeah. or, or Facebooked me back and said, would you be willing to talk to us every month? <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's bigger than our Bible study yeah. here in Indianapolis. John has been contacted by some uh, elders, I think it was in Pakistan, that wanted to translate one of his books into their local language so that they could use it for teaching their 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 flocks there. And what I'm saying is I'm not bragging. I'm I am giving God the praise that the message that He's anointed John with, and it took John years and years and years of study and a lot of the Holy Spirit to get to this point. But he's sharing humbly with you the things that God has revealed to him. Whether you accept it or not, it's up to you. He's just the messenger. So, and we're exploring different, yeah, absolutely. different beliefs, sure. like in this series. Exactly. Hell yes. And, uh, Hell no. This, some people you know. are very frustrated by the fact that we give credence to both sides of an argument very strongly, and we'll also say if there's any weaknesses, we'll do that too. But the whole idea is that we're not here to tell you what to believe. We're here to tell you what the God's Word says that that we've come up with in the research we've done on on. Uh, context, historical context, hmm. uh, audience relevance, all the things you need today take into consideration when you say, what does that scripture say to you? So anyway, uh, I didn't even name the name, say the name of the series. Uh, uh, this is greater than we believe. <laughs> this today is going to be video number 230. We're still in the playlist, the sub playlist called the all controversy, which is a sub playlist under greater than we believe. We've almost spoken this to death, but we're finally coming to the point. This particular one is called Thinking Outside the Box Like God. And so once we finish this, then we're, the next few weeks, we're going to start discussing, we're going to start doing what we call the synthesis of argument. And that that is what I think a lot of you have been anxiously awaiting. <laughs> and so thank you for your patience. Meanwhile, John, let's not beat this dead horse. Let's just get right into it here. <laughs> tell me what you've got to tell today. Well, the battle lines are drawn. Okay. The sides are fixed. Mm -hmm. The arguments are exhausted. Mm -hmm. From the time of the prominent early church father, Stephen, nothing has been resolved or scripturally reconciled mm -hmm. in this great area that we, we are calling the all controversy. Yes. Just argued mm -hmm. until now. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Lord. <laughs> so in this great debate and stalemate and standoff and so forth between Christian universalist mm -hmm. and Christian exclusivist mm -hmm. over the eternal afterlife destiny of the lost mm -hmm. and the damned, uh, we have tried to stress sound biblical hermeneutics, have we not? Yes. Uh, in analysis of competing and conflicting positions and pro and con arguments, have we not? Yes. And yes, the stakes are high, but something is lacking. Yes. When questions of the ultimate and eternal destiny uh, of billions upon billions of unevangelized and Christ rejecting non believers hang in the balance, more is demanded than human opinions. Yes. Well, I think, uh -huh. or I've been told, yes. and so forth. Uh, or debates, or rote repetitions of traditionally held beliefs. Well, I believe that, mm -hmm. and so forth. Would you agree or disagree? I agree. Would you agree or disagree? Well, they agree, because I'd agree. <laughs> That's a good point. So, as we continue, Stephen, to re-explore the possibility that God's grace, mercy, love, justice, and wrath may be far 
different and more extensive than our limited earthly views. And might it also be greater than we believe? <laughs> and greater than we believe? <laughs> Let's readdress how we might be able to honor all the demands of yes. Scripture on this issue of the all controversy. Yes. And harmonize and reconcile them via a solution of synthesis. Yes. Now, I used a solution of synthesis in my doctoral mm -hmm. dissertation. Yes. So this is not something new to me. It's just a new one, a new solution to synthesis. And one that is consistent, coherent, Christ-honoring, and Scripture-authenticating, and faith-validating. Does that sound of interest to you? Mm. To you? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, to get us started, I have identified and boiled down from all the sides in this great debate that I'm calling, what I'm calling, the 12 demands of Scripture. Okay. for salvation and eternal life. The okay. 12. Mm -hmm. Now, there may be more, Sure. but at least we have the 12. Yep. And I got the 12 from somewhere else. Mm. What do you think? Probably from Bible. Which <laughs> is the yeah, best the 12. Place yeah, yeah. Well, this is a different 12. <laughs> so I believe they are clear and emphatic and inescapable. Yes. And I welcome to hear from you from what you think. Yes. If they are. Uh, I also think they're exhaustive. Mm -hmm. So we'll see if we agree. Uh, and you may be able to think of others that I've missed and so forth and that we must also satisfy, or, or satisfy but you know, let me know. Let sure. us know. Uh, as my wife, Cindy, uh, tellingly commented while proofreading the manuscript for my book, Hell Yes, Hell No, back mm -hmm. in 2010 11. or 11, when well, 11 was published. You wrote it, yeah, published it in 11. He said, I can't wait to see how you synthesize all this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you can't either. Yeah. So let's get into it. What do sure. you say? All right. Admittedly, synthesizing the all uh, and the different opinions and, and the ground that we've covered in the seven argumentative areas that we've mm -hmm. covered in uh, our videos 207 through 229, mm -hmm. which is a whole bunch of videos there, uh, and uh, parts two and parts three in the book, Hell Yes, I Don't Know, uh, is somewhat of a daunting task. Yes. I think you all would agree to that. And I, as far as I know, it had never been done before. Mm -hmm. So, are we locked, Stephen, into a hopeless, deadlock stalemate on this? One that is not just difficult, but impossible mm -hmm. to harmonize or reconcile or synthesize, as many would contend? Well, let's begin our synthesis process and see. So, if we are ready... Are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready. And help me out on this? Sure. All right. The 12 demands of Scripture. <laughs> Give it a little accolade Attention. here. Attention! Yeah. Uh -huh. For salvation and eternal life. Number one. God's numerous statements that he will do all that he pleases, Isaiah 46, 10 through 11, 14, 24, and 27, 55, 11, Psalm 33, 11, uh, 115, 3, 135, 6, Daniel 4, 35, Job 23, 13, uh, and 42, 2, and Hebrews 6, 17. Have I mentioned enough yet already? <laughs> and works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, Ephesians 1.11 and 2 Timothy 1.9. This includes God's not wanting any to perish, but everyone to come to repentance, 2 Peter 3.9. And all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of truth, 1 Timothy 2.4. So that all who die in Adam will eventually be all saved in Christ, mm -hmm. Romans 3.23-24, and 15-18-19, and, and, and 1 Corinthians 15. 15, 22, 23. That was a mouthful. <laughs> That's number one. <laughs> number one. <laughs> we won't go that far in the rest of them. Number two. <laughs> number two, grace abounding much more than sin. That's taken from Romans 5, 15, and 20. Number three. Number three. Jesus being God's only provision for and the means of salvation and eternal life as the Savior of all men and especially those who believe. Notice the especially. Yep. 1 Timothy 4.10. Number four. A specialness and incentives for those who believe are saved and obedient in this life. 
Number five, salvation only coming to a person after hearing about it. Romans 10, 13 through 14 and 17. Number six, salvation only coming to a person after the Father having mercy on them all. That's from Romans 11, 32. Drawing them, that's from John 6, 44. Enabling them, from John 6, 65. Unhardening uh, Romans 9, 18, and 11, 7 through 10, and or regrafting them in again, Romans 11, 23. Isn't that something? Yep. All this is scripture. Mm -hmm. Number seven, salvation only coming to a person after a willing and conscious profession of faith and belief and placing one's trust in Christ and his work on the cross and resurrection from the dead. All people must do this to be saved. Uh, Romans 10, 4, John 1, 12, 3, 15 and 36, 6, 47 and 8, 24, number 8. What about the those who do? Oh yeah, and those and, 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 and but those who do not so believe, they are not saved, and do not enter, nor have eternal life. Instead, they are condemned. Mark 16, 6, John 5, 28 through 29, Jude 4, and God's wrath remains on them. John 3, 36. Now number eight. Now number eight. Given the paucity, if not, not total non-existence of scriptural support for the orthodox, traditional, the modern day doctrine and understanding of air quotes, hell, <laughs> we must Air consider, quotes would be like this. Yeah, that's what I did. You just did one. Well, did the one, yeah. yeah. You know? <laughs> we so, want to be accurate here now, yeah, Stephen. For know? the uh, orthodox, traditional, and modern day doctrine and understanding of hell, yeah. we must consider this mainstay of Christianity as not being part of God's plan of afterlife punishment and or redemption. Hell no. No. <laughs> Nine, but eternal judgment, punishment, loss of rewards, and fire are certainly real mm -hmm. and part of God's justice and wrath in the afterlife. Yes. For both unbelievers and believers. Yes. Number 10, the individual reality frequently spoken of as both perishing and destruction must also be worked into this synthesis. Ooh, yes. Yes. Number 11, the fate of the under unevangelized, those who have never heard about Christ or the gospel of salvation, must be better explained than has been done to date. Yes. These include those who died as unborns, mm -hmm. which there are more and more of those nowadays Sadly, in our yes. modern day advanced society. Mm -hmm. Infants, young children, mentally disabled, pre-Christ heathen, and post-Christ heathen. And number 12, I'll do that one. Mm -hmm. If all the above demands, brothers and sisters, are true and reconcilable in a proposed synthesis fashion as we are advocating here, Stephen, then several other major concepts in modern day Christianity will have to be readdressed and redefined in better agreement with what the scriptures actually present and with more accuracy, brothers and sisters, than what is currently being taught and preached today. This includes evangelism, yep. missions, mm -hmm. eternal security, mm -hmm. the Great Commission, mm -hmm. and even the question of what is the gospel. Yeah. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. Overall here, my reflections on these 12 demands have led me to conclude that they all can be met. Mm -hmm. And a conservative Bible honoring and reconciliatory synthesis achieved. And yes, Stephen, I'm aware that this synthesis may arouse fierce opposition. Yes. From Christian exclusivists. Sure. Other people don't care. 
And I do find both perplexing and disturbing the idea that just entertaining this possibility, even from a conservative evangelical standpoint, might cause some to accuse me of forfeiting my claim to being an evangelical mm -hmm. or even being a Christian whatsoever. Yes. Are you sure you're a Christian? Mm -hmm. However, and hopefully, this synthesis exercise might give us a better, broader, and greater insight into how God's loving forgiveness and reconciliation may be consummated along and in harmony with his revealed let me use that word again revealed mm -hmm. in his word as we will be ex deeply exploring yes and consistently exploring his revealed will his revealed desire his revealed purposes Grace, mercy, and one more thing. Character. Love. Love, yeah. As well as with his righteous judgment, justice, and wrath. Now for a disclaimer. Okay. <laughs> now, saying all that great stuff. Just because these demands may be reconcilable and synthesizable does not mean that this synthesis is right or correct, nor that I am right. I know that I don't have all the answers. If not, ask my wife. <laughs> no, I don't even have all the questions. I am simply seeking truth. Yes. I am also aware that I may now be entering into territory that no one else that I'm aware of, brothers and sisters, has trodden or mapped. Yes, I confess that I'm compelled to see if all these demands of Scripture can be reconciled in a practical and Christ-honoring manner. And I hope you are too. Yes. Nevertheless, let's now see if all these demands of Scripture can be reconciled via a solution of synthesis. In other words, how might it be possible for God to save everyone? Hmm. Eventually, and in harmony with all the demands, raise that up, wave it around, with all the demands. I hear the word. All the demands <laughs> revealed in his word. And to do this, we must think outside the box, yes. as we've titled this video. Yes. Like God. Like God, right. Unfortunately, we humans tend to box ourselves into narrow mindsets. We tend to put God in a box, which is a mortal sin. <laughs> and nowhere, Stephen, <clears throat> may this be more true than in the topic we are exploring. Yes. But let's keep this higher perspective in mind, brothers and sisters. If you will read Isaiah 55, 8 in this regard for us. Isaiah 55, 8 says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Wow. That's also remember that we are delving into a mystery. Romans 11, 33 and 36, if you would. Romans 11, 33 and 36 or through 36? Uh, 33 yeah. to through 36. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the depth of the riches of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable his judgments and his paths beyond tracing out. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has been his counselor? Who has ever given to God that God should repay him? For from him and through him and to him all are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. Yes, we are in deep water. Yeah. Are we not? Consequently, our problem solving uh, attempt via this the synthesis approach may be more than some of you are capable of grasping. Mm -hmm. So just be forewarned, be forearmed, so forth, or can handle. Mm -hmm. But for all of us, it is surely uh, more than any human being can explain. <laughs> we'll just explore. Mm -hmm. And yet this verse must encourage us. Luke 1, 37. Luke 1, 37. Well, that's a long one. Get ready. For nothing is impossible with God. What? 
Nothing. <laughs> well, what's the rest of it? You said it was that's long. it. Oh, that's it. Oh, you were being facetious. Oh, being a little facetious. All right. Yeah. All right. Indeed, brothers and sisters, thinking outside the box, so to speak, means that we think outside the limit of mm -hmm. this earthly life. Yes. And into the unlimited realm of the after life. And who of us would doubt that this is how God thinks and acts? Mm -hmm. Perhaps God's will, desire, and purpose says do extend beyond this life as well. Don't you think? Yet exclusivists like Erickson warn us <clears throat> in his book, How Shall They Be Saved? warn us about the downside of trying to think this way, especially in regards to this exclusivist paradigm. Would you please read on page 21 that marked in mm -hmm. yellow for you? He says, it is very easy to be ethnocentric, to think of one's own way as the right way, and indeed as the only way. When something different was encountered, it was immediately thought wrong by virtue of being different. Wow. Yeah, it's different, must be wrong. Well, we're definitely in that category, yeah, wouldn't you think? Absolutely. Oh, okay. One relevant example of this type of negative reaction is contained in World Perspectives, this course that I took a mm -hmm. number of years ago on evangelism and so forth, and it teaches with great confidence and little, if any, support. Mm -hmm. Are you ready for this? that universalism cannot be reconciled with biblical data. Hmm. And it also adamantly admonishes that, quote, we should refrain from such theorizing. Hmm. Well, we're not, hmm. are we? But as we shall see, their opinion may not be as valid if we are willing to think outside the box, like God. Mm -hmm. All right. Ah, uh, and yet, exclusivists like Erickson, did I, I already said that, haven't I? That was what I just did. Yep, 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 okay. But, in this book, and Greater Than We Believe video series, this mm -hmm. book, Hell Yes, Hell No, and Greater Than We Believe video series, we have bounds. And they are these 12 demands of Scripture for salvation and eternal life that we already presented in this video earlier on. Therefore, as we proceed together, brothers and sisters, let's do so with a sizable degree of humility. After all, we are departing rather significantly from the mainstream of Christian tradition, are we not? Even exploring this at least after its first 500 years. See again our videos 207 to 210 where we, where we laid out the fact that Christian universalism was the dominant belief in, early, in the, 500 the church for yeah. the first 500 years. And as we seek a scripturally viable solution of synthesis to help us break out of our mental mindsets box and in, and in this two millennial debate, and search for a resolution of how God may indeed extend salvation beyond those elected or those who choose it in this life and hunt for a better, more biblically accurate, consistent, and reasonable way of understanding God's plan of redemption and for dealing with this problem of sin and reconciliation. McDonnell, in his book, The Universal, uh, The Evangelical Universalist, is also astute when he acknowledges the fact that, quote, the debate needs to move into a new arena. Mm -hmm. Well, that's where we're going. Yes. I mean, these 12 demands of Scripture, and we'll get into a synthesis of them in a, in a future video, are certainly a new arena. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you agree? Wouldn't you agree? Okay, and as we seek to resolve and reconcile a synthesis to the tensions inherent in this debate and keep asking these questions, and there's four of them I'm going to be asking. Number one, if universal salvation is indeed God's plan, 
and his will, desire, and purpose, why can't he accomplish it? Hmm. Two, will he fail? Hmm. Three, can he be thwarted hmm. by human free will? Hmm. Or Number four, or are we the ones who possibly have failed to properly understand and appreciate his revealed character, nature, thoughts, and ways? But hey, people go to seminary. They're smart. They know things. They're smarter than us, so they must be right. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Obviously. <laughs> no. No. <laughs> Such a harmony and reconciliation, however, is desirable. Yes. Would you agree? Uh-huh. Some won't agree. They want to see all those people suffer. Yes. Uh, but desirable if it can be done without twisting and distorting God's revealed word. Right. And staying faithful to these text. Christianity Today magazine, in an article back in um, 2011 uh, by Galley, uh, argued that eternal damnation and salvation are irreconcilable paradoxes that remain a mystery known to God alone, end quote. And others have maintained, such as uh, Perry and Partridge in their book, Universal Salvation, maintain both damnation and salvation texts are important, and both are true. Mm -hmm. So who do we believe? Mm -hmm. Perhaps the most appropriate, Stephen, way to end this video and set the tone for our transition into our final concluding videos are these words from annihilationist uh, Thomas Johnson. In his book, in P and P, if you would re read for us in yellow, page eight seventy eight, please. He says, <clears throat> "Our theology is continually being revised, modified, and deepened as we submit ourselves to God's Word. It is not helpful, therefore, to come to the study of universalism with our minds already made up." as is often the case. It is best that we both generously, we be both generous and wary in our reading of each other's interpretations of Scripture, especially on controversial issues. We should not too readily say that a particular view is unbiblical or without scriptural warrant, especially if it is a view that is contrary to, to or challenges what we already believe. Amen. On to the synthesis. Mm -hmm. In our next video, we will begin boiling down these 12 demands of Scripture that we covered in this, this video into seven, seven, mm -hmm. <laughs> seven points of synthesis for addressing and documenting how all this might, could, and may happen without God violating, undermining, compromising, or conflicting with any scripture in his revealed word. Mm -hmm. And as we test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will in this matter, Romans 12, 2. Amen. Is that it? Fasten your seatbelts, brothers yeah. and sisters. I wouldn't want to miss it. <laughs> Thank you, John. Folks, um, I took a few seconds and wrote some notes because I didn't want to forget to say something at the end here. I seem to be having a lot of end, end time thoughts, I mean end thoughts lately, and I'm, I'm not trying to run the thing along, but we get a lot of feedback on our videos on, e on YouTube, but also in our uh, Facebook Greater Than We Believe uh, page. So we get a lot of input from people around. Um, I want to make sure we make something clear. John has been very careful to continue to use the word Christian universalism. People still complain about universalism. I do too. I don't believe in universalism the way most people look at universalism. They say, ah, oh, all roads lead to God. Doesn't matter what religion you are. Doesn't matter what you do in this life. It don't matter. God's going to save us all anyway. Nothing matters. It's a universal thing. 
That's not what we're talking about. So when we, no. if you hear the word universalism, don't think that we're defending that kind of statement. I've had people right at the end say, I can't wait to see how you explain how all, all roads lead to God. So I'm not going to because I don't believe that. No. And so when John also, he uses... Which is part of our 12 demands. Yes. Yep. John talks about uh, exclusivists, and then he talks about Christian universalists. Well, we have to be sure to say, by the way now, the, universe, the, the exclusivists that we're talking about believe that Jesus is exclusive and is the only yes. way. Guess what? Christian universalists are exclusivists too. Yes. Because they believe that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. So we want, don't want to make it like, well, we have people that say exclusively, you have to go through Jesus and Christian universalists don't say it. They do say it. We just don't use that term. So you need to understand too people are also look at this and, and say this is some pesky new thing that's coming out it's a new age this is something new and it, and it goes against the long-standing 2,000 year tradition of truth I disagree mm -hmm. what's happening is for the first 500 years of the church this was just understood to be truth. The dominant view. Yeah, the dominant view. And so what's happened over the years because of people's pride or arrogance or an agenda looking for power in the church like the Catholic Church did when they decided, let's do a fiery burning hell. That'll scare people good. That'll really put them under. There are so many things that have come out over the years that have twisted the original truths that now what we're doing is we're not going and saying, there's just something new. This sounds good. Mm -hmm. And we're saying, we've got a lot of problems with what we're believing now because they were variations of a twisting off of, off of the original what, what the Bible originally was, was teaching. So the whole time Jesus was with his disciples and immediately after his death, when they were at Pentecost and the Holy Spirit fell, and that first few years in the Acts 2 church where they were having the home fellowships and were, were ha having such an outpouring of the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and the apostles, many of them were still alive. There was a time there where there was a oneness of thought. And it wasn't until the apostles died off and people started getting, I'm going to be, I'm going to be a, a leader in this church. And I'm going to, you know, I got an idea about something, you know, I think you're wrong about this. And that's when they started having a little disagreements and most people were just humble enough to say, well, when you guys make up your mind, tell me, and that's what I'll believe. And so over the years, that's how we've come up with so many variations from what was the original. And so we're not trying to come to you with something new and, and pose it as this is like new light from God, or this is, this is what we're trying to do is we're trying to get back to the original truth of the Bible, something that, that has always been truth and it has been covered over by man, either through man-made teachings parading as doctrine or through traditions of men that never really had scriptural support but they mm. just over the years said well we've always believed that so it must be truth so I call it myth busting when I'm on uh, Facebook mm. so I just I'm bringing that out just to make sure we understand where we stay so you can say universalism if you, if you want to but please at least if you're going to say it say Christian universalism to make mm. sure people understand and what I prefer if you're going to do that, let's get right to the most. I like to say Christian universal reconciliation because that's the whole purpose of what our lives, it, what Jesus' sacrifice and his death on the cross and everything else was to reconcile us back mm. to what we lost through Adam. That reconciliation. I believe it's not just for a few. Jesus did it for everybody. And one way or the other, he's going to get the job done. And if you get everybody that ever lived, past, present, and future, if you eventually get them all to that point, well, that sounds universal to me. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, I'm going along. I'm going to stop here. I just wanted to make sure that we have a clarification of terms and that we're all on the same page about, yet yeah, Jesus is my Lord and Savior, and he's the only way, the only way this is working for any of us. Amen. And... Um, we're not trying to come to you with new things or new understandings. This is we're just trying to get back to what was we believe was the original consensus of thought that God intended for us to have for the first 500 years. Yeah, absolutely. So anyway, that's that's my little piece for tonight. We love you. We we pray for you, and uh, John and I both we we just are so privileged to be able to have a share in in bringing this to you, and we're both human. We both make mistakes if we have done or said something in the past that didn't seem you know it didn't didn't fall on the, on the ears right let me apologize for that what we're trying to do is everything we say we're trying to say it in love and sometimes the truth hurts a little bit and sometimes we'll say something it's a matter of truth as far as we're concerned but sometimes it'll hurt somebody say so, well that's that's not very loving you know mm -hmm. we're not trying to be brutal 
We're just trying to be brutally honest, like the name of our, <laughs> let's be brutally honest here. So please know that we pray for you. We prayed just today again, right? Every time we do a video, we always pray first because we want this to be God's message, not ours. Hmm. We want it to fall on the ears to where they help you understand scripture better and, and speak to your heart and help you in your relationship mm. with God. This, this is important to us that yep, that, that yep. does that. So anyway, God bless you. We'll see you next week. All right.